So thank you all of you for joining us for our third annual John Collins Monday Evening Exploration, the first evening program of our 2021 season. And it is wonderful to see you all back here. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's patience. It's been a, we're a little rusty on having evening programs again. I'm Cheryl Bronstein. I am the Director of Interpretation. Please join us every um, Monday for the next six weeks for one of our Monday evening explorations. So next week's program is a Zoom program. It is one of the programs in our Artist and Inspiration series. Um, you can register for that program on our website. And the program is We Are Related, Voices from Turtle Island, featuring Carla and Babe Hemlock. This Wednesday, we have our introductory Wednesday evening at the museum program. It will be Sunset Swing, a World War II themed dance party with instruction by Saranac Lakes, the, um, Saranac Lakes the Dance Sanctuary. Uh, Wednesday evenings are also going to be held through August 18th. We've got one more dance party coming up. We've also got bingo and two live concerts. And all of these programs are free. Um, we do ask people to go ahead and get tickets or register for the programs or reserve a space through our website. And all that information is available on the adkx.org. Be sure to check out all of these events. Before I introduce this evening's programs, I do want to let you all know that this program is being recorded. Um, so if you know anybody who wanted to come and missed it, they will be able to see it on the museum's website in just a few days. Also, uh, we've got the restrooms are right behind me, and we've got emergency exits both behind you as well as through the door when you, where you came in. So tonight, I'm very uh, pleased to introduce our evening's presenters. Um, we've got Zach Collins right here. Zach serves as the team leader of the Embedded Behavioral Health Clinic for the 2nd Brigade Combat Team. 10th Mountain Division, Light Infantry at Fort Drum, New York. That is quite a, <laughs> that's quite a, um, the military big has a great, in the army. <laughs> yeah. uh, for the past 10 years, he's been in that position. He specializes, he specializes in treating post-traumatic stress disorder and relationship issues and earned his PhD from Binghamton, Binghamton University. Helen DeMong, who will be joining us shortly, graduated from the Crane School of Music. She spent the last 12 years working with Creative Healing Connections, where she facilitates Adirondack Arts Retreats for women who have served in the military and women serving, surviving chronic illness. She grew up in an army family, and here she is, and learned firsthand some of the challenges men and women who serve in the military experience. We have got Dr. Daniel Way. Dr. Way practiced rural family medicine in the Adirondack Park for 37 years as a member of the Hudson Headwaters Health Network. He is a noted photographer and author, including the book, which he's got right next to him, We Were There, World War II Stories from the Adirondacks' Greatest Generation. His father, Daniel Way, was a sergeant in the Army Corps of Engineers stationed on Guam during World War II. And finally, Tom Williams. His military connection started with his father, who served in the US Navy during World War II. He has been a supporter of Wounded Warrior Project programs, along with fundraising efforts for other veterans' causes in New York State. Tom is a marketing professional and entrepreneur, a lifelong outdoorsman, Eagle Scout, licensed guide, and currently serves on the New York State DEC Conservation Fund Advisory Board. We're going to start with a few presentations by each of the tonight's speakers, and then we'll open it up to a conversation, to questions that any of you might have. So with no further ado, we're going to take this in somewhat chronological order, starting with World War II and Dr. Daniel Way. Thank you, Cheryl. Do you want the mic? Okay. <coughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, hello everybody. I'm glad to see so many faces here. Uh, it's uh, great to see you all here and interested in uh, World War II and in the military. Um, I'm uh, the son of a World War II veteran, like probably a lot of you folks are. And uh, since as far back as I can remember, I was very interested in World War II history. Um, I, I read books about it when I was in eighth grade and everybody thought I was a geek, and I probably was. but. It's just been a, something I've always been interested in. 
uh, by the 1990s uh, when I had been a physician in Hudson Headwaters for 10 years. I had already been able to interview some World War I veterans in the beginning of my career. And Dr. Wade, can you please use the mic? It's a little hard to hear you. Okay. Uh, by the 1990s, I was becoming more and more interested in reporting the stories of these veterans as they um, got older and older. I also was into photographing my patients and writing stories about them, uh, even if they weren't veterans. So over the years, I collected quite a, a number of stories and, and images. I would borrow their materials and scan them and uh, archive them for them. And it just uh, became more and more of a, an obsession, you might say, to the point where uh, I find that uh, I found that I had to put these into some kind of document, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, we were there, World War II stories from the Adirondacks' uh, Greatest Generation. I wrote two other books before that, and there are some World War II stories in the first book as well. Anyway, um, let's get this show started here. So, yeah. World War II was uh, a terrible conflagration, but uh, before the war started, we had already been dealing with the Great Depression for 12 years, and uh, it was for many people as traumatic as the war itself. Over a million families lost their farms, nine million people lost their savings accounts, there were two million homeless people migrating around the country, there were farming communities in rural areas that suffered uh, as their crops uh, became less valuable on the market. Over 60% of Americans were categorized as poor, and in New York State, social workers were reporting a 25% malnutrition rate in children, and in some states, you could see that the, the rate was as high as 90%. But what about the Adirondacks? The people of the Adirondacks were probably better prepared for of combat uh, than most Americans because they were um, dealing with more adversity and having to learn extra skills that the average person uh, didn't have. So that was somewhat useful. And the Civilian Conservation Corps was very active in the Adirondacks in the 1930s and many of the men that I knew uh, from that era learned valuable skills including land management, hunting, fishing, logging, construction, and so on. And some of them already had many of these skills uh, that they had learned from their, their fathers and their mothers. Even today, many Adirondacks, uh, Adirondackers still survive in trailers and century-old houses, uh, living partially off the land. Uh, they don't have internet, they don't uh, seem to be interested in it, and uh, they don't know what a cell phone is, and they seem perfectly happy that way. For many residents, uh, going to the nearest airport or train station or bus uh, stop or grocery store is a, an all-day affair and Wi-Fi and cell phone coverage is still non-existent in many parts of the Adirondacks. But what they lack in cultural sophistication and monetary wealth uh, is well compensated by them having retained the ability to eke out an existence under very uh, challenging circumstances and it sort of forced uh, them to be very self-sufficient and they still are today. Let me give you a couple of examples, and I'm going to have to read from my notes because otherwise I will talk all night. Um, this is Robert Barton. Uh, he was a patient of mine for many years. Uh, he grew up in a broken home. Um, he was left with an abusive and negligent father in Warrensburg at age eight while suffering from an osteomyelitis infection of his right thigh bone, which was very painful and debilitating. He missed three years of school because of that. His father left him home alone all day, leaving him to scrub floors and things like that. And finally, uh, as the infection finally began to heal, his older brother Ralph, who was five years older than him, came down with their mother and they rescued him and brought him up to Indian Lake, where he uh, lived for the rest of his life. Uh, he was 11 by that time. Uh, he had to catch up on school and by the time he graduated from school, he had grown to over six feet high. Uh, he learned how to uh, catch fish. He was a crack shot. Uh, you can see the deformity of his right uh, leg there. And uh, although he wanted to um, 
become a sharpshooter in the army when he joined the army after graduating high school. They wouldn't allow it because of his leg. So he became a quartermaster in the China Burma India Theater, and uh, he was involved with the you know the dispensing of equipment and supplies uh, as needed. And in his spare time, he would go tiger hunting on elephants. So he had some pretty interesting stories, but it wasn't all fun and games. He also uh, developed malaria three different times while he was in India. And malaria was a very serious business back in those days. Over 60,000 uh, troops and allies uh, died in the Pacific theater of malaria. And uh, the treatment for malaria was a drug called atabrine, which uh, was a very bitter pill. And it, it just burned the esophagus all the way down. And it was just absolutely terrible to uh, take. Uh, so while he was laid up with um, malaria, he would send uh, love letters to his girlfriend, Frida Monthony, back home. This is uh, one page of a six-page valentine that he sent her while he was suffering from malaria. And the poem says, If I come down with GI ills, they stuff me full of GI pills. Ointment and drops are GI too, but GI heal just seeing you. Is that romantic or what? Uh, later on, um, after the war, he came back uh, home. Uh, he married Frida. Uh, he, he was um, in, involved with the, the environmental conservation. He was a forest ranger for many, many years in the West Canada wilderness. This is the West Canada um, ranger's cabin where he lived with his wife, Frida, and this is their daughter, uh, Rhonda, who uh, was my receptionist at the Indian Lake Health Center for many years <laughs> and is my next door neighbor up here in Indian Lake. Small world. That's another thing about the Adirondacks. It's a microcosm. This is Bob's older brother, Ralph. Ralph was five years older, and he was uh, the one who came by and finally rescued his brother while his father was off doing something and brought him home to Indian Lake. Um, he also was involved with the, the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. He learned how to build uh, campsites and buildings and other structures. Um, in fact, later on, after the war, he resumed that kind of activity, and. Does, any, does anybody recognize this bridge here? This is a pioneer bridge. Ralph is the one who re, rebuilt that bridge after the war. But uh, during, the, during the time that he uh, was still at home, he, after high school, uh, he, uh, he was in the CCC for three years uh, looking for diseased trees and building campsites until he finally uh, enlisted in the U.S. Army. He wanted to see the world. He joined the Army in 1940 and was, uh, he, he was assigned as an engineer to Hawaii, Oahu, and he thought he had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> but on December 7, 1941, he almost did die and go to heaven because he witnessed, he was there for the entire Japanese attack. He told me that he was strafed by a Japanese zero. He said he could have lit a cigar from the tracers going by his shoulder as they were tossing the trash cans and other stuff into the air. He watched the whole thing. Uh, later on, his military unit, uh, he was an infantryman. He was assigned to the 25th uh, Army uh, Infantry Division, which uh, invaded Guadalcanal. He was there for the Guadalcanal campaign. He survived that. Uh, then he came back to uh, rest in uh, New Caledonia for a while, and then he was assigned to um, his, his unit was assigned to be involved in the invasion of Leyte, or not Leyte, uh, Luzon in the Philippines in 1944. And on the way to Luzon in his troop ship, the, uh, the Japanese, Japanese submarines attacked and were torpedoing ships in the convoy. Uh, scared, he said that was the scariest thing that ever happened to him. He was helpless in this boat. He could hear explosions and he, had, he couldn't do anything about it. And then he was on the front lines of, of combat for 186 straight days in, in the Philippines before General MacArthur finally sent his whole unit home. He said, you boys have had enough. But by war's end, he had defied death so many times that he began reading the Bible and he became a devout Christian, uh, which he felt saved him from an eternity in hell. Uh, upon returning to Indian Lake, he immediately found work driving trucks and he fell in love with a petite little redhead named Mona Savari, who he met at the Locks Dance Hall, which is right near where um, uh, Ralph's sister-in-law, or daughter-in-law lives. 
um, and uh, they got married. Um, she worked at Camp Driftwood at the time, uh, and uh, he was with his CCC skills after the war, he was able to build them a house for $500 all by himself. Uh, he became an ordained minister and for several years he managed parishes throughout the small Adirondack towns until his PTSD finally calmed down enough that he could settle down in one place in Indian Lake. And uh, he and his brother lived within a mile of each other. Uh, you can see this is his Guadalcanal uh, unit here. And here, uh, here's uh, Bob and Ralph together. Uh, they, uh, they really were brothers in arms. Uh, this is a story I have to table because we don't have time, but I can talk to you about it later if, if we have time. Um, in the exhibit at the museum here, if you haven't already seen it, um, Elmer Norton was a torpedo man uh, and, uh, and on a destroyer, and he had two ships sunk out from under him. Uh, Joe Minder is in my first book. He was a POW at uh, taken, uh, taken prisoner in Corregidor at the very beginning of the war and was a POW for the entire war for five years or four and a half years and in the uh, Philippines and then later in Japan. Uh, his story is, is breathtaking. But the, um, the thing about Adirondackers is uh, Bill uh, McKibben said it better than I could. Uh, since almost no one living in the Adirondacks can make a living doing just one thing, the average Adirondacker has many more talents than the average American. In my experience, the world contains no finer blend of soil and rock and water and forest than in the Adirondacks, and no place where the essential human skills of cooperation, husbandry, and restraint offer more possibility for competent and graceful inhabitation. And why do we care? Why should we care about World War II history? Because in this modern day, uh, it's a very um, tense environment uh, around the world and in this country. And one of my favorite uh, quotes is from George Sadiana, who said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And uh, God knows what would happen if that was the case. Anyway, I still have other copies of my, my book here after the talk is done. Uh, feel free to come on down. I'll be here for a while. Thank you very much. One thing, as a teacher, I've learned, whenever you use AV, you get ready to have, uh, to be really flexible and improvise. For the last century, working women have traveled to Wheelwalk, a holiday house. It's a restorative lakeside retreat in the Adirondacks to relax and recharge. Wheelwalk was deeded to the social activist Mary Fuller in 1905 as a retreat for women working in New York's garment factories. The word Wiawaka translates to mean the great spirit of women and adds another dimension because of its history and because it is a place specifically for women. Creative Healing Connections is a nonprofit group that uses Wiawaka to host a retreat for women veterans suffering from PTSD and MST. During their time at the camp, the veterans gather for talk therapy, creative arts programming, meditation, and healing massage. For the last 12 summers, this retreat has reached out to female veterans in an effort to help them work through the psychological scars that so often accompany military service. To have the healing Adirondack Woods setting at Wiawaka 
gives us the feeling we are held together in a special cocoon for the time that we are together. We serve as guides. We open ourselves up to hear the personal stories that the participants share. It is this time in our sacred circle of sharing that we experience the connection, the empathy that transforms us. It's in this safe circle that women can let go of fears and allow the tears to flow. We come together with one heart and give each other the compassion that every woman, that every one needs so very much and deserves. Our staff of Adirondack artists represents various art forms which encourage participants to express themselves and through that communication to find healing and a sense of community. Creative Healing Arts Women's Retreat is open to any woman who has served in any branch of the military at any time. This Adirondack Retreat will focus on the unique issues arising out of military service, including invisible wounds. This is an opportunity to learn from others who have served our country and how to be both a citizen and warrior and gain the skills that will enhance quality of life. We serve the particular needs of women who are veterans. Some are homeless, some are challenged in being able to hold down a job. Many suffer from MST, military sexual trauma, and TBI, traumatic brain injury. All these women need a place where they can connect, develop, and continue friendships, gain new skills, express their feelings, and heal. This is a poem that was written by one of our women at the retreat. Her name is Linda. It's called Unity and Strength. It is a time we come forward. We have waited long enough to be recognized as veterans. We fought numerous battles of attitudes and prejudices. We are indeed unique for we are risk takers and groundbreakers for joining the service. We've marched in every war, helped fight behind the lines and on front lines with you. We've dealt with hostility by being put in places where we weren't wanted. We've been ignored, harassed, threatened, and assaulted. We've faced the same enemies as you even had more enemies than you. For sometimes, you were our enemy. We're not here to point a finger, to condemn or make accusations. We're here to join hands and voices in unity and strength, to claim our right to be recognized, just, not just as women veterans, but that we are veterans too. The best way I know how to share the work I've done with Creative Healing Connections is to share the words and thoughts of some of the women vets. A few years ago, we had a group come and take a video, and because uh, some of the women are very shy of being with men they don't know, they asked if they could contain it to one activity. And this activity is called the Prayer Arrow Project. They're originally called Prayer Arrows by the Plain Indian people. And what they are, are the prayers they took into battle. If you want to let go of something in your life that you've been holding on to <coughs> or perpetually thinking of, you could do a sacred arrow and let that go. Every time you let something go, 
you leave room to fill that space with something. So we fill that empty space with goals and aspirations. It's a great goal setting technique where we can sit with ourselves and ask ourselves, what do we want? What do we want to let go of? Okay, we're clear about that, but what do we want to create or do going forward? Right about now, we would be having a video <laughs> of the Sacred Arrow project, and I brought one that I made and <clears throat> to explain to you, uh, one of our staff members brings materials, all different colors and textures, and just places it on the floor and asks everybody to find a stick in the woods, something that calls to them. And then when they come to this activity, they're asked to not speak for the time that they're doing this. They're just hearing Kelly talk about what is happening. And she explains to them, pick out the colors that speak to you. And they don't even know what she's talking about. But sure enough, you go and you, and you pick colors that you're attracted to. And then she starts talking you through. Think about something you would like to let go. What would you like to let go of? And she said, you cannot tie any knots. All you can do is wrap. And so you start, and you feel clumsy. You, don't, you think this is going to be a horrendous activity. And you start wrapping. And as you start wrapping, you think about what it is that you want to let go. And then she said, now switch to another color. Think of one other thing you would like to let go. A situation where you felt intimidated or harassed. Do you start wrapping with a different color? And there's something where you go really deep inside because you're not talking. You're listening to yourself. And then you finish that wrap. Now think about something you want more of in your life. What's one of your goals? And you start wrapping another color. And this may sound like a very simplistic activity, but there's something, things tend to bubble up. And you feel a sense of relief. You let something go. You've got it. I'm You've sorry. got it? <laughs> okay, so if you want to move to 